Get ready to challenge conventional beliefs about what's possible in creating health, wealth, and happiness. You are listening to Playing on the Edge Radio with Megan Edge. This hit show is providing you with ways of sustaining radical and powerful changes in your life. It is time to open and expand your awareness, accelerate your well-being as Megan shares wisdom, teachings, and experience from a lifelong journey of the heart. Enact the power of radical change with ease and lift your desires to a new perspective. Now, here's Playing on the Edge Radio. Yeah, boy, I'm Dr. Pat, and I get to hang out with Megan. Hi, Megan. Hi, everybody. Yeah, boy. (laughs) Um, You know, what a great show we've got planned for you. And this is big for me today. This is really big. I mean, this is um, um, today's show is the courage to be vulnerable, coming down from the pedestal of victimhood. And you probably if you're watching on Facebook Live, I don't know if you know what you're thinking or why you're thinking it. But (laughs) Megan, Megan, we decided to really show up. Uh, in ways that you and I have experienced vulnerability. Tell us about mm-hmm. your way. Mm. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the mask off for a moment just because I have to hold it up otherwise. Oh, <laughs> but okay. the, whole, the whole reason for the mask is to recognize how often we hide, like we were talking about in our last show, how often we hide behind these masks, these ideas of the ways in which we think people need to see us. So the fact that we show up today like this <laughs> and being particularly goofy demonstrates a level of vulnerability where we're stepping into the knowing that we can show up like this and we can have fun with it and the audience can enjoy it and appreciate it or think that we're completely ridiculous and none of it matters if we are comfortable in our skin and we're comfortable in the way that we're showing up. I don't know. You know what scares me more than anything I actually think I wear my mask really well. That's <laughs> like, great. what does that say about me, right? Um, well, it matches the background. It matches the background. The other <laughs> thing, too, that uh, is so important to talk about is some of the things that we do that feel very right for us in our lives mm-hmm. uh, may not feel right to other people. And we subject ourselves to right. a level of vulnerability that maybe we don't call vulnerable. But Mm. let's talk about why being vulnerable is important. You know, what is it about vulnerability that's a game changer? It's you showing up. It's you showing up in your life as who you know yourself to be, whatever that is, and allowing that to be what leads you as you move through your day. In the understanding and the confidence that how other people receive you, how other people experience you, is actually none of your business and not your responsibility. And that's not an easy road to walk, to say, I'm going to show up warts and all. This is me. I'll let you see me. And you may like me or you may not like me. And that level of vulnerability, that level of being able to say, here I am, have your experience of me, isn't something that we're taught. So instead, what we do, like you just described, Pat, is to let ourselves try to fit into what we think other people's expectations are of us, and also what we've learned is a safe way of expressing ourselves. And we end up making ourselves fit into our culture's ideas of ourselves, our family's ideas of ourselves, our own ideas of ourselves even, which don't, in fact, connect us to that authentic potential that we have. Yeah. You know, in the last hour, I was talking about um, uh, just a little aha moment I had. First of all, this is an 11 year. Uh, Secondly, Mm -hmm. it's the 70th anniversary of uh, Israel. Um, and third, it's also, you know, the year of Jubilee, abundance, prosperity. Mm -hmm. And so someone said to me the other day, they said, man, it doesn't feel like that. And, you know, I had to stop for a minute and I thought, well, wait a minute, look at what's happening. 
miracles. This is the year of miracles, Mm -hmm. but it requires us to super show up, man. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it does. It It does. uh, Or else you miss it. You miss it. And the other part of being vulnerable is that it doesn't mean that we're vulnerable and we're sitting on our couch and not moving. There's an action for us to take. Yes. And it also doesn't mean that we're not safe. Oh, that's right. right. Mm-hmm. Because I think we have this idea in our culture that to be vulnerable is to be weak. Mm-hmm. weak weakness means that we get taken advantage of and bad things happen to us. And then we're vulnerable. And there's there's these different layers and levels to vulnerability, like how you and I are showing up today with our fun masks and our fun outfits. You know, I've got my healer's boa on here. Um, these are fun ways to be vulnerable. These are ways yeah. for us to show up and say, hey, here I am. I'm me. Yeah. Like, yeah. like me or don't. And then there's then there's deeper ways of being vulnerable that really are challenging. They really are scary. They have real consequences in how your life unfolds, right? And it makes me, I, I go back to my marriage of 23 years. And when I began the process of, of stepping out of that marriage, I had to do an enormous amount of soul searching to discover where I had gotten myself to in that relationship. And how over many years, and with no evil intention on anybody's mm-hmm. side, but had allowed myself to get really, really small. And in a way, there was comfort in that. Yeah. Because I understood it. And I actually felt at the time kind of empowered by it, if that makes any sense at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just this just this idea of, well, I'm here. This is my family. This is my little world. The rest of the world doesn't need to know what's going on. I don't need to know what's going on. It's all good. Blinders, <laughs> mask, <laughs> the whole nine yards. Then as I started to step out of it, recognizing how weak I had felt in that experience actually like the truth of it was I felt that my kindness my patience my forgiveness was awkward and made me weaker because it didn't allow me to stand in my no or say what I needed and have it be met and so there was this whole process of first of Mm -hmm. all understanding that's what had happened recognizing the turnaround from is that really a weakness is kindness right. a weakness mm-hmm. or if somebody takes advantage of that kindness is that actually their karma and not mine and then doing the reframe and standing up and saying actually yeah I do need help and that's a level of vulnerability as well when we get to that place and say this is the help I need I can't do this on my own and, and when we say I need help I mean somebody else is going to have to come and hear our story and see the places we don't want anybody to see. Yeah. As we take those masks off. You know, I interesting story. I didn't know that this came up, but uh, it did. I was preparing for the show and I was looking at the notes and what we were doing today. And I had a flashback to when I was a kid and I uh, grew up in the, in the Bronx. And uh, I was always a tomboy. I was out there. I wasn't like my sisters. You wouldn't jump in rope. No, you couldn't get me off roller skates or Mm -hmm. stick ball or down the community center. But I was always out there. I was always out there. And I remember the first time my mother put a bra on me. (laughs) Oh, my God. And (gasps) I'm thinking to myself, as I'm thinking about this show today, that thing popped right up. Because all of a sudden, I am like, just like the boys, and I'm doing all this stuff and, you know, whatever that looks like. And then I get this thing, right? And out we go in a summer day, summer Mm -hmm. day in the Bronx with the same kids. And I'll never forget this. And I went out and all of a sudden, it became a thing. Now- You know, I don't know what most little girls do in those moments of vulnerability, Mm. Uh, but I walked over to Alex and I gave Alex the biggest, fattest black eye that you could even (laughs) imagine. And then I moved on with my day. (laughs) Uh, I love it. I love it. And that's just, that sparked a memory for me that is so similar. And and like you, I was a tomboy Yeah. uh, and coming from Vancouver. So I'm up in Canada in Vancouver back in the seventies. 
we were running around in the summertime, mostly naked, to be honest, little, little kids, you know, we're in the backyard, we're in the, the pool. We moved to Montreal when I was seven years old in the summer and below my house was a park and all the kids in the neighborhood played in that park. And I would go down there in my shorts and go play with all the kids. We're playing ping pong. And oh. I know you play ping pong, right? Yeah, I play so ping pong. playing ping pong in the park. And one of the boys said to me, you hit like a girl. And I put my hands on my hips and I said, I am a girl. And you should have seen his face, his jaw dropped. He said, but I can see your nipples. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but two seconds ago, you saw my nipples and they were boy nipples, according to you. And now they're girl nipples. And now it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Right. And then the shame started to come in yeah. around that. Yeah. Like, yeah. how dare I? Don't yeah. I understand the protocols? Who am I to say? Yeah. yeah. That's a, yeah, it's a big deal. It is a big deal. And our lives are filled with these. The question really is, what is it we're afraid of in the mix of this? Mm -hmm. What are we afraid of? Now, I wish I could say that I grew up not having all the foils of foil, foil, this, like all of this crust around <laughs> stuff. That's not me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what is it that we can learn? And I just had another experience. But here's the deal. We don't live in a closet, in a dark place, in a house, generally speaking. We are of the world. Yes. And we get out in the world. And today the show that you're bringing to the forefront is what we're going to be able to do about it. But what mm -hmm. about this thing that so scares us? What is it about that? And why can some of us become the queen of denial? Let's take a short break. <laughs> Let's take a short break. <laughs> Megan Edge. Yep, that's what we're doing today. Playing on the Edge Radio. I'm Dr. Pat. Today, the courage to be vulnerable, coming down from the pedestal of victimhood. Listen, if you're feeling vulnerable and not sure what to do with it, Go to Facebook, to, uh, uh, facebook.com, Transformation Talk Radio, or go to transformationtalkradio.com. Type in your vulnerability point. And if you want to get some help and guidance clearing that Megan does, blessing on this, we are all in for you. You can also mm -hmm. call us, 1-800-930-2819. We'll be right back. Isn't that cool? That's I love Eric. That. I love that story. Yeah. Love er Eric, what'd you play? No doubt, just a girl. <laughs> I love it. Don't you love No Doubt? Yeah. Ooh, yeah. boy. Yep, <laughs> no doubt. And that's so, what we're talking about today. Yeah. And Pat, I want to say, I love your hair. I Thank love it. you. Good for you. I know. Go on being, being courageous and brave and standing in how you want to show up in the world. I love it. I know. It's interesting. There are a couple of schools that thought about that and, you know, and about my hair. I didn't know my hair would be such a thing. <laughs> and I love this. So people want to explain why I would do this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Explanation number one, she's hiding the gray. No, no, I don't like mm -hmm. have the gray. So mm -hmm. it's not that. I yeah. just love it. Yeah. I just love kind of that. And it's, you can't see it on camera, but the sides are like, what do you call it? Razor shaved short. Oh, yeah. 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 Awesome. Um, how do we move beyond the fear of either whatever's going on inside of us, Megan, mm -hmm. or whatever the outer world may present to us as a fear barrier? Yeah. And, and the, the fear is something that it seems to underlie so many conditions and so many symptoms. And when I'm working with my clients and we come up against these fears and they, they usually show up as all the things you can't do, 
like you've tell that all the things you're telling yourself you can't do and all the reasons why you can't do it. What I want to do with them is to get them right into those fears and identify what they're actually saying and then finding the source of them. How did they show up in this person's life? Where did they learn them? Who told them about these fears? Who gave them these fears? And then are these fears true? right? Is it true that you're not lovable? Like, let's say we've gotten down to the very bottom. This is the card that's holding up the whole house of cards. The belief is the fear is that you're not lovable, that you're not going to be able to be loved. So we want to start questioning that. Oh. Is it true? Is it really true? And not from a place of judgment, from a place of curiosity. I Maybe it is true. I would suggest in 99.9% .9 of the times it's not, but the person has to get there themselves right? If that's their biggest fear, they have to find that fear and feel it in their body. See all the places where it's shown up in their lives. See all the places where it's led them into the validation of that belief and that fear. And then do the questioning around it. Is it true that you're not lovable? And if the answer comes up, yes, it's true, then we go, we, we go into it again. We keep asking the question and we break through the belief that it is true until we find it's like the birthright belief that you know it's not true. You came into this world lovable. So if something's happened along the way to create for you this fear that you're not lovable and that nobody's going to love you, then we want to find out where that came from. We want to find the source of it. And then we want to work with it because this is the beautiful thing about our fears. They're not here to harm us. Our fears are here to help us better understand ourselves. And so instead of pushing them down and getting sick because of that, or making ourselves wrong for the fears, or feeling vulnerable and like we don't have a voice or confidence, what if we were to play with those fears and start asking our higher self, why is this showing up? Like one of my fears, my one of my biggest fears at the physical level is to lose my eyesight. <sighs> There's nothing in this lifetime, this current life of mine, that would support that fear. So my suspicion and the work I've done around it is that it comes from another time and place, a past life experience, one or two of them that have come to my mind. Nonetheless, it's showing up in this lifetime as a crippling fear. So right now I've got my reading glasses on. Behind my reading glasses, I have my contact lenses in. I'm terrified if the apocalypse ever happens and I lose my glasses or my contact lenses and I can't see the person right in front of me and what their what their facial expression is and what their emotions are or I can't see the sunset or the sunrise that it, I feel it in my solar plexus the visceral response to that fear so the questioning that I want to do with myself is where is that coming from and how is it serving me and how can I do the questioning around it? All right, so there's lots of symbolism we can look at of, of eyesight. Is it how I'm seeing the world? Is it how I think the world sees me? Is there some old pattern there about vulnerability and having to rely on others for help if I become blind? And what does that kick up in me? And for the most part, because I have contact lenses and glasses, I go through most of my days not thinking about it. <laughs> The challenge that I've set for myself that I have yet to do is to actually take off the glasses, take off the contact lenses, and spend a week in my natural eyesight. I've tried now three times, <laughs> three summers in a row, I've said to wow. my, my tribe, okay, here's what I'm going to do, everybody, count me out on it, call me out on it, make me accountable for it, and I get about two hours into the experiment, and I've got my glasses back on. Wow. Right? <laughs> So there, there it is. There's a fear. I'm still working with that fear. It's a very real experience to not be able to see. That's a, it's a legitimate fear. It's like fear of heights. There's a healthy aspect to the fear of heights, unless it's becoming crippling to the point where you can't stand on a balcony, right? Or if it gets to the point for me where I have to wake up with, put my glasses on immediately, or however it would show up that it would become that crippling, right? Yeah. And that, that connects in with our physical bodies. And for most people, our biggest fear point, our biggest vulnerability point is going to be something on our physical bodies. Yeah. 
Wow. Right? It's going to be our gangly knees or our double chin or acne from when we were kids. Yeah. I think, you know, what you're talking about is so super important because in a sense, we don't want to face something we know might be happening in our bodies. And so what we do is we don't face it. And as we don't face that, it continues to get progressed, whatever the thing Mm -hmm. is, whether it be progressed for real or progressed in our mind. And, you know, I've watched this um, with uh, people that I've sat next to in Dr. Darvish's office, and I've watched this, especially in the Lyme disease community, where the worst fear for many, many people, my friends, my family that I know back on the East Coast, but also here, and I, actually, Dr. Ronnie, Dr. Darvish, and Dr. I were talking about this, mm-hmm. is that people will face fears for a lot of diseases. For example, nobody wants to hear you have cancer. Mm-hmm. Nobody likes to hear that. Mm-hmm. But the minute you say, or you hear a doctor say you have cancer, probably the next thing is this is what you can do. This is our game plan. Right. For Lyme disease, no. And so unless you see Bonnie or Dr. Darvish or a handful of people, Mm -hmm. they will be able to say that. And so what we're seeing in in the community is two things working at odds. One is I don't want to know that it's that. And so therefore, I'm not even going to I'm not even going to I don't want to know. The other thing is because it's a disease that can progress in the brain, you don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it's all fear Mm -hmm. and it's all fear. And to face ourselves in any light, whether it's Lyme disease, whether 30 more pounds on our body, uh, eyes, hair, uh, and boy, I'm not even going to talk about my knees today. We're not even (laughs) going to we're not, that, that is like, we're not having that conversation today. Are they knobbly? Are you have oh, knobbly knees? Boy, it's like, you don't even want that, that, that's my thing. That's the thing with the knee. Um, uh, because I did go through, uh, 10 years of a chronic illness. Hmm. We can learn tools to move beyond it. And that's yeah. the work you do. 1-800-930-2819. We'll be right back. Yeah, boy, that's what I'm talking about. Mm. Uh, and and if if you guys have ever heard me sing on radio, boy, I'm telling you now, that'd be a point of vulnerability. <laughs> Seriously. I'm Dr. Oh, Pat. Me Megan too. Edge. You're listening <laughs> to Playing on the Edge Radio. All right, Megan, before we talk about vulnerability and, and really vulnerability and what to do about it, uh, mm-hmm. when we enter into fear and shame. How can people find out more about you? And let's talk about, you know, some of the things you've got going on to help people. Yeah, absolutely. So I am online. I'm at meganedge.ca. That's our website. We're on YouTube at Megan Edge Healing. LinkedIn, Megan Edge Healing. Facebook. I think I even have a Twitter account <laughs> that I sometimes use. <laughs> um, you can always email me. Megan at meganedge.ca. I love hearing from people that way. Lots of lots of ways to find me. Yeah. One of the things we're going to do, though, is we're going to talk more about shame and we're going to talk more about vulnerability. But let's talk about what we're giving away today. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to show a demonstration of what we have here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, these are 
what we call our love notes. These are greeting cards based on the Healing Hearts Oracle cards that I've published. So you get the beautiful picture on front. This was my fireplace on Main Island. I looked up one night and there was this incredible heart log in the fireplace. And this one's called Passion's Heart. And then on the inside, you get the information, the channeled message about it. And then you've got a blank space to write your own message. Do you want to hear what the what the message is? Yeah. But Passion's Heart? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It says, fire invokes images of nights and days of passion, of the complete joy in your body and soul, united within the body and soul of another, of all of your needs being exceeded, pushed to your limits in physical craving. Challenge what you think is possible in passion. I mean, we could have a whole series on sex and vulnerability, because <laughs> that's a huge talking point right there. But again, you know, it's about opening yourself up and letting people see you and letting people in. And if the passion's heart card shows up in your oracle card spread, you've got some fun work to do around what you're passionate about. It could be what you're passionate about in bed and it could be what you're passionate about in life. Mm -hmm. And how is that showing up for you? How are you yeah. working with that? Yeah. yeah. So what we're doing today is when people call in or they chat with us on the Facebook page, I think we said the first three Callers yeah. coming in. Yeah, I'm going to send you three of these love notes, a little package for yourself to work with. All right, so let's do it. 1-800-930-2819. When you call in, uh, please, we'll take the first caller uh, that Eric will pick up. 1-800-930-2819. And then you're going to need to give us your name, your address, your email, your phone number, all of the above. So let's get that done. For those of you watching on Facebook, all you need to do is write a comment right there, facebook.com, uh, Transformation Talk Radio. Just write a comment, say, yep, I would love to get some help with this. Please send me a card and type your name in your, and, and, and a way for us to contact you. We don't want you to have to, we don't want you to put your address all over Facebook, but put your name in there and I will get a way to get a hold of you. So well, you know what, they can send us a friend request. If they're on Facebook, just send us a friend request. Oh, there right? you go. Line from the show yeah. or something like that. So we know. Yeah. Who, yeah. who knew about the friend request thing? <laughs> Not me. Uh, so 1-800-930-2819. Just dial in and there you go. Um, listen, part of talking about this is talking about vulnerability and shame. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, we alluded to it a little bit with a couple of the stories. Yeah. Um, but shame is that thing that will diminish the flame of our passion. Yeah, it, it's crippling. It can be absolutely crippling. And one of the things that I've been working with recently with clients especially is, is this concept that the shame that they may be living in, embodying in themselves, isn't actually theirs. It never was theirs. Mm. It was something that was given to them because of an action that they took or something that they did that was contrary to somebody else's idea of them, of what's proper, of what's moral, of what's right. I mean, certainly we can talk about sex and shame. There's loads and loads of things that could be discussed there. Even just showing up as yourself, even putting up your hand at school and getting the wrong answer and having people laugh at you and point at you, you, you collapse into this sense of shame. And yet it's not yours. It's coming from their experiences, right? Cultural shame, religious shame. Oh, good Lord. There's a whole other <laughs> series of episodes that we could do. All of it is external. It's coming from somebody else's ideas and then you, for whatever reason, and there's no judgment or blame around it, you've taken it on and made it true for you, right? And then at that point, it settles into your body and it becomes, over time, if it's not healed, understood, worked with, it becomes the illnesses that show up for us, or at least it can, in some cases, become these, these illnesses, and think of what often accompanies when someone says that they're ashamed of you for your actions. There's often a this that comes along, right? It's the finger, the shame, I'm so ashamed of you, that pointing finger, I'm just going to 
cancel that because I don't want it to go. Yeah, down. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's cancel, clear, delete that. So there's even that physical gesture that creates within the energetic field of each individual, if they've had that experience, that embodiment of shame. And any of our callers or listeners or, or watchers, anybody in the audience, when we say the word shame, like where does it go for you? Where does it land in your body? Because it's it, it is in there. It's in there somewhere, that shame piece. So what I've found has been happening is I've been working with clients and showing them, demonstrating to them that the shame isn't theirs. We're able to put it down. We're able to give it back to the person who gave it to us so that person can do their work with it. All right, we do that as a visualization. We do that as an energetic thing. We do it without the intention to harm. Because so often it's not even intentional, the shaming. It's not even intentional. It's a cultural thing. You you were yeah. born into it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. God, there's so much to it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things, uh, somebody made a comment to me over the weekend. And, you know, I mean, everybody that listens to the show knows I go play ping pong, table tennis, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's my joy. It, it's like my joy, happy place. It's like my happy place. I mean, I work like 80 hours a week, right? You know, because I love what I do. Mm -hmm. But but twice a week or so, I like to carve out a couple of hours. And that's my happy place, right? Yeah. And so off I go and I do this. And, you know, I play on the weekends. And there's this one gentleman that just totally, I let him get under my skin. Mm. So the other day, you know, up to this point, it was pretty much like about my playing, like you're not serving the ball legally, like I'm not there. Okay. But this weekend I was done playing. We were all getting ready to go home and he just turned to me and he said, you know, you know what? You don't take criticism well. Ooh. Oh, did he do this? <laughs> he might as well have done that. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, okay. I, you know, I don't yeah. know anybody that takes criticism well, but I do take feedback well. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but it went from, all right, I don't throw the ball high enough, which is totally not the truth. Right. To this thing in front of a group of people. Yeah. And I, I'll tell you, man, we have to make decisions on what we're going to do with things like that, don't we? I mean, this is the work you do to help people yeah. excel in their lives and really demonstrate mm -hmm. amazing things that could happen. Mm -hmm. But how can we help people today have the courage to be vulnerable? Because if we're not, we would never do anything, really. That's right. We would never take a risk at all. You know, everything that we've worked on so far since the beginning of our show, the, for, the first episode on storytelling and how to change your story to change your life. And then we moved into the Bionic Woman, Wonder Woman episode and empowerment. And then last month, it was all about authenticity and stepping into our authentic self. Each of those shows has ways in which we can do this work like the, the visualizations that i've shared the tools and techniques that we've worked with if you were to watch all of them and then today you've got already this beautiful toolbox of ways in which you can work with this information the first thing i i believe is to actually recognize and acknowledge that there is this place of vulnerability or that you do have a fear or that your behavior is somehow reflective of these internal dialogues that you're having, that you're not even aware you're having sometimes. Right? These old reels, these old tapes of being and how to be showing up in the world. I have a beautiful visualization called the center stage visualization that I would love to share. Shall, shall yeah. we? Okay, yeah, on. let's do it right now. We're gonna go ahead and skip the break. And also we would like to give another card away. You could either go 425-373-5527 for those of you that are not able to get into the 800 number or 1-800-930-2819. Say hi to Eric. Okay, I'm ready. All right, beautiful. So sitting comfortably, close your eyes. 
Inhale deeply. And allow yourself to completely relax on the exhale. We're going to do it again. Breathe it in. Drop into your body. Breathe it in. And on the exhale, release. All in any worry, pain, shame, vulnerability. Just let it go. And then imagine for a moment a beautiful stage. It's a wooden stage, old-fashioned, heavy red velvet curtains, wooden stairs on either side. Rows of seats march up off the stage. Behind the curtain, I want you to visualize a heart, your heart. Imagine your heart behind this beautiful curtain and see it beating full of life. There's nobody in the auditorium right now. It's just you on stage behind the curtain in the shape of your heart. As you stand behind the curtain, fully, embody in, fully embodied in your heart, you hear the door open at the back of the auditorium and you begin to hear voices as people begin to file into the space. They're chattering, they're excited, talking to one another and finding their seats. They've all come to see your heart. How are you feeling behind the curtain? feeling the anticipation of all of these people, hearing them laughing and talking. Move into what your heart is feeling at this moment. There's a hush that goes across the crowd and the lights go down. All of these people are waiting for you to open that curtain and show up fully in your heart. Peer out from behind the curtain and look at all those faces. These are the faces of people whose paths you've crossed. These are the, the faces of people who are in your life right now. And these are the faces of people who you will meet in the future. And they are all here to see your heart. Before you open the curtain, take a deep breath. Get grounded in your heart. Now, open the curtain and step out onto the stage. As you do, there's an intake of breath. <gasps> look at the faces of all these people. What do they look like? They're smiling, they're in awe. Their mouths have dropped open at the sight of your beautiful heart on this stage. They begin to clap, they stand up, they applaud. They're so happy to see you in your full authentic heart. They are so supportive. You have made such a difference in their lives because you have shown up in your heart for them. All you had to do was be there and let them see you. The applause dies down. They all sit back down in their seats and the curtain closes. The excited chatter resumes as everybody talks and, oh my gosh, did you see that? Did you see her heart? Did you see his heart? Oh my, it was amazing. They start to file out of the auditorium to share with their friends and family what an incredible experience it was to see you like this. If you need to, you can stay behind the curtain or you can walk down the stairs, out past all those empty seats and out into the world and know that because you took a chance to show up in your true heart, everyone who sees you and crosses paths with you will be inspired to do the same. Take a deep breath in and exhale. Slowly open your eyes. Look around your present surroundings and take another deep breath back into your body. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Um, you know, so often we, we lose our memory of how we absolutely can be the champions in our own lives. Yeah. You know, and, you know, where we are is looking at this state of victimhood that so often we fall into. Yeah. And, you know, I remember when I was on my healing journey, somebody asked me a question about what did I think the benefit of my illness was? Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, at first you respond with anger, 
then frustration. But then, you know, every day I'm on air and the light bulb goes on and you say, yeah, there is a benefit. This is what being, you know, not being well, this is what not being well uh, enables me not to face in my life. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm not saying that that's a pleasant thing to do, nor do I recommend doing that by yourself. Mm -hmm. I recommend working with Megan you know, to find out how you can move beyond. But let's talk about this victimhood idea Mm -hmm. and the fact that if we don't get some tools, just like you shared, we can stay there a really long time. Yeah. And we may not even realize that's where we are. Mm -hmm. We may not recognize that we are allowing ourselves to be a victim or to be victimized. And I want to be really clear that I don't mean to suggest that if you have experienced or are experiencing things in your life that are unsafe, where you are getting hurt or the people around you are getting hurt, that you should just roll over and show your belly. Not at, no. not at all. That is not what this is about. It's about recognizing that that's what's happening and then taking the steps to get the help and the support that you need to not be in that unsafe place anymore. Having said that, even just in our day-to-day conversations that we have in the bank lineup or at the grocery store or out walking the dog with friends, pay attention to how often the conversation is a complaint about all the things that seem to be going wrong, either in someone's life or in the bigger picture. To become mindful of that, you start to really recognize how often that's happening and how often you can easily fall into that as well. You know, the poor me, the blaming everybody else. Again, it's not an easy path to say, okay, I'm going to own this now. I'm going to decide that how I felt that day when he said that thing to me is actually mine and I have to own that. (laughs) It's not, it's not easy. But what I know to be true is the moment you say, yes, this is how I would like to learn how to be in the world. Opportunity shows up to help you learn how to be that way in the world so that we can step down off that pedestal of victimhood and be empowered in ourselves and in our responses and in our reactions instead of just having that knee-jerk pattern of making everybody else responsible, right? I mean, at a certain point, you have to come to a place in your life where I, I believe you have to come to a place in your life where you stop blaming your parents, stop blaming your teachers, Stop blaming your ex-boyfriends or girlfriends or spouses and decide to take on responsibility for what is yours. That, to me, is the fundamental and foundational way that we do this work, whether it's authentic self, story, words, it's vulnerability, it's courageous, it's all of that. It's you saying, I am owning this. Because then you get really clear what's yours and what belongs to somebody else. And once you get really clear on that, it's much easier to do the work on what's yours because you're no longer burdened down with all the things you've taken on over your lifetime that actually belong to somebody else. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love about this is that there is a solution. You know, there is an answer. There is a way to change it. And, you know, there's a reason you and I are sitting here talking about it. And it's not because, you know, we're sitting on a pedestal and, you know, preaching at people. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I know what it's like to be stuck in victimhood. I really do. I, I, you know, honestly had a couple of decades of that when I was younger. Um, It's really also uh, this, um, it's insidious in a lot of ways because, We so stay in it that we don't recognize it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it's not denial. It's kind of like it becomes a way of life. Mm -hmm. And then that way of life supports more about that. And so we can't see empowerment because we think what we're, what we're doing and where we are is like normal. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when we are continuing to look outside of ourselves for validation of who we are. We may be constantly asking for somebody's opinion about us. How do I look today? 
Do yeah. I look big today? <laughs> Does this make my butt look big? <laughs> and then basically the favorite stuff, question. Do yeah. I look fat in this? I look fat in this? And then basing our experience of ourselves on what somebody else has told us. Yeah. Right. That and it's something we do all the time. It's how we're brought up. It's what we believe to be normal. What if you change your normal? Yeah. Right. Do those things like we've talked about in some of the other episodes. Use your I statements. Instead of you make me feel so angry, I feel angry when. That's yeah. ownership. That's ownership. And yeah. part of what we're talking about today is the courage to be vulnerable. So we're looking at vulnerability as a strength. Yeah. We're not saying don't be vulnerable. That's not it at all. It's reframe. Find mm -hmm. different language. Go and read Yvonne's book again, <laughs> The Power of Words, right? Yeah. There are lots of tools. That's, that a, that's Yvonne Oswald, yeah. Yvonne yeah. Oswald, yeah. Yeah, it's a good idea. That we can use out there. I've got loads of them that I've got them on my YouTube channel. I've got those visualizations. I've got the workshops that I've done, the talks that I've given. They're all there for free. All of my teachings are up there that people can watch on their own time in the comfort of their own living room and they yeah. can feel vulnerable in the moment of it if they want to or they can do whatever they like with it. You know, the bottom line with all of this, I think, is when we decide to, to give to the world ourselves, our story, right? This is what that can look like. It can look like a book that you've written. It can look like a deck of oracle cards that you've created, you know, these different tools, these different ways of sharing your story. As you put that out into the world, you step back from mm -hmm. it because it's not yours anymore. Yeah. And that is a huge piece of vulnerability. And yet the experience of it can be so empowering when it is well received. Well, before, listen, I want to make sure you are holding up the book and the book set. How can people get their own book set? How can they get the book? How can they get the cards? Uh, all of the above. And also, uh, how can people work with you? Because I think this is where I've never been able to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. Really. I, I really look forward to working with people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I am in Victoria, Canada. I know a lot of our audience is not necessarily here and not within even driving distance. So we've got this beautiful technology. We've got Skype. We have FaceTime. We have lots of ways that we can work together at a distance. I have healing packages that I offer. So there's ways to do it financially that makes sense for people. Like I say, there's also the YouTube channel with lots of you know, if you're not sure you want to work with me, if you don't know yet, go watch that stuff that's out there and make up your mind about me. And if I'm a fit for you, then great. And if I'm not a fit for you, call in somebody else, right? Put out the invitation because if you're ready to do this work, you're ready to go into that vulnerability and you're ready to do the healing so you can stand in your authentic, empowered self, find the person to work with, right? Whoever it is doesn't have to be me. Although we'd love it if it were because I know we have an amazing audience out there who are who are empowered, definitely. Um, in terms of getting the, the, so what this actually is, is a box set, I can just hold it up. That's the inside, you get the cards, there's a pen, there's two books. One is the journal, so you can do all your journaling work on it, and then The Heart's Journey is the book that talks about my story and how all of this came about, all these healing products came about, and the courses I teach and the work that I do. And then I teach you in there how to work with the Oracle cards as a meditation tool, as a healing tool, and as you saw with the gift card or the greeting card, each card has its own story, its own channeled message. And those messages are my personal experiences of working with my heart. When I created all of this, Pat, I just had to put my heart on a platter and listen to what it wanted me to do. Yeah. Trust that it was going to be okay and know that not everybody was going to love it. Yeah. And that's okay. It so, is okay. It's okay. Yeah. 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 And that's the really the message for everybody. It's OK. And, you know, part of what Megan and I are saying to all of you is it's OK to be you. Yeah. All of you. Please, please be you. <laughs> please. Yeah. So that we get to know you, we get to experience you. Just show up and let us see you and trust that it'll be OK. Because it really will. It really, really will. I love it. Yeah. Megan Edge. I'm Dr. Pat. Dr. Pat, <laughs> with the awesome website. Story. Let's do it with the white hair. <laughs> Give out your website real quick and thank you for today. www.meganedge.ca. All right, everybody. We'll see Take you care. next time.